Um, Nancy, I'm going to imagine that finding the archival footage and um, photographs for this film was a real adventure, and it's so beautiful. The, the, uh, <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Um, it was an adventure, and we found more than we ever imagined we would find. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, we had an abundance of riches, and the fun of it was not only finding it, but then figuring out what to use and what not to use, because there's ample more that we could have used in this film. Um, and, I, and I really have to thank Damien Rodriguez for working with me, you know, day in and day out in the edit where we kind of put it all together and um, it was a great puzzle and it was a great adventure. Damien's here, he should stand up. Where is he? There he is. is. <laughs> and did you know early on, I mean, I, I, I gather that you probably early on decided that you wanted to start and end with Afternoon of a Fawn, but then I guess early on maybe you decided you would also use WC as a kind of a... Um, yes, um, the WC music inspired me to, in some ways, to make this movie. I had grown up watching a film called Portrait of Jenny, and the very same music is used in Portrait of Jenny, um, woven throughout the entire feature that is used here. So. Afternoon of a Fawn, of course, goes with Afternoon of a Fawn, but Girl with the Flaxen Hair and the Arabesque Number no. 1 have nothing to do with anything that Tanny ever danced to, but were part of Portrait of Jenny. Portrait of Jenny is really a story about an artist and a muse, and had influenced me, I guess, from since I was a little girl, and when I heard Afternoon of a Fawn, it just kind of, I free associated to the rest of the Debussy music, and it just felt like a natural. A favorite of Louis Bunuel, by the way, oh. that movie, Portrait of, <laughs> Portrait of Jenny. Wonderful to know. Yeah. Um, and what, what brought you to the story of, of Tanny Leclerc? You know, Tanny Leclerc, I mean, I really have to share this applause with her because she is such a complex and seductive subject. I don't think you could want for a better subject. Um, I looked at a film of hers made by, um, it was called uh, Something to Dance About. It was another American Masters film. And is Susan Lacey in the audience? I didn't acknowledge her earlier, but good luck, Susan. <laughs> Susan's on a new, starting a new chapter soon. But um, that was a film that I had looked at, made by American Masters. And there's a short three-minute section in it on Tani, uh, because she had been a great inspiration to Jerry, obviously. And even before I knew her story, I was riveted by watching her dance. I literally sat on the edge of my seat when she came on the screen. And I was fascinated by the fact that I didn't know very much about her when I realized what had happened to her um, and that she had basically receded from the public. That explained to me why I knew so little about her. Although people in the dance world knew her very well, I as a, as a, as a lay person did not. And I virtually committed myself that day to make the story, make the film. So what was your pathway uh, into making the film and making contact with the people who knew her? You know, it started with a um, New York City ballet dancer named Ricky Weiss, or Robert Weiss, who actually runs the North Carolina School of, ba uh, North Carolina Ballet um, in Raleigh, um, and was a friend of mine in North Carolina. And I told him I wanted to do this, and he had known Tani as a child and knew so many people who knew her. He quickly introduced me to Barbara Horgan, and Barbara Horgan was a great supporter of this film from the very beginning, um, appreciated Tanny's need for privacy, but also felt it was time uh, for us to tell her story. And she then started connecting me with other people, including Jacques D'Amboise. Jacques was a very early um, participant in the film. We did an interview with him um, before we did an interview with anybody else, actually, and he helped create the arc of the story for us. And once we had that arc, we pretty much knew where we were going. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. What did you take from your first film that allowed you to progress in this? What was it that brought you to this? You know, I'll, I'll just repeat oh, the question sure. in case. The question is, what did Nancy take from her first film that brought her to make this one, that she, that she used for this one? You know, I think that one of the things that um, people responded to in the first film, the first film is a story, it's called The Loving Story, and it's a, f and by the way, my partner on that film is in the audience too, is Elizabeth James is somewhere back here, put her hand up somewhere, there she is. Um, that was a film that 
um, was basically a civil rights story, but was even more importantly an, a powerful love story. And I think both of us felt strongly about communicating the emotion of the story as compared to just the facts of the story. And I, I think that's what I took with me to this film, that this, obviously, there was very important content in Tani's life, but how did it feel to go through what she went through? And how should we feel as an audience responding to that experience? So um, it was as critical to me to communicate the feeling and the emotion of a dancer who cannot dance anymore as it was to just tell you what happened in the, in the linear story of her life. But you're also telling the very particular story of this incredible, incredibly close relationship between Tani and, and Balanchine. That's correct. You know, both, both of these films are love stories. And I think that Tani's film, Tani's story, is a more complex love story. I mean, Richard and Mildred Loving, who are an interracial couple who were arrested in the 50s for um, anti-miscegenation, uh, they were they were a, a couple that never they they, they never wavered. They were um, profoundly in love with each other, and that never changed. And they had to go up against a system that didn't support their love. Uh, in this case, this was a complex kind of love. This was Balanchine and Tani were, um, in many ways, the classic artist muse relationship. Um, both of them complicit in it, by the way. A, a lot of people like to make Balanchine out to be a bit of a cad, but you know, he, not only did he benefit from Tani's um, incredible and unique physicality and personality on stage, but you know, be sure that Tani also benefited hugely from her relationship with Balanchine. Um, and so th th it was a complex relationship, and so, so too was it with Jerry Robbins. So um, we don't have quite the simple fairy tale that we have in the loving story, um, but I think it's something that really kind of provokes thought about what it is to be a dancer um, inspired by a choreographer like Balanchine or Jerome Robbins, and then what's, what is it like not to be able to do that anymore? Yes. yes. I'll repeat. <laughs> Could Nancy elaborate on, on Tani's dislike of Jerry Robbins' ballets? <laughs> you know, I'm not sure I really can speak to that. That was Pat McBride Lusada who, who said that, and she was very close to Tani, and I trust that that was something that, sh that Tani had communicated to her. Um, I really think that the point of that comment was not so much that she disliked Jerry Robbins' ballets, but that she was so profoundly inspired by George Balanchine. Um, Balanchine was uniquely musical. Uh, Tani was very musical herself. There, I'm sh there are a lot of dancers in the audience, and perhaps they can answer this question better than I can, but one of the things that has been commented to me often is that Tani really understood music much the same way that George did. And so I think that they felt very close to each other in the way they, they, um, they responded to music, uh, her on the stage and him being inspired by the music to create the ballets he did. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Good. Yes. Somebody was pointing to someone. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> oh. Please. Yeah. Damien. <laughs> uh, Well, you know, the, the ballet footage... So, I'll, oh, sorry. I'm going... Yes, just give me a chance. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, this is a question about the other footage that Nancy referred to, that the, she's, you know, f uncovered a lot of footage, and the question is, is there, are there any plans to use any of that footage in another form or, or to make it available? Well, not at the moment, but I'd certainly be happy to talk to somebody if they were interested in, in looking at more of it. Um, I think that we used most of the, um, the really fine um, and, and, and presentable, if you want, footage of Tanny dancing. You know, people didn't record dance in the 50s and the 40s the way we do today, so we didn't have as much as, as we have today. Um, the much of the footage, the home movies, so to speak, that you see are either was either shot by Jerry Robbins, 
or by Martha Swope, who was a very close friend of Tanny's and a great ballet photographer. And she was on that trip with Tanny through Europe. Um, and there is more of that. But, um, you know, I, I, if you have any ideas, Damien, <laughs> I'd love to hear about it because there is some wonderful footage. Thank you. Um, also, there's, there's a wealth of television footage was a lot. Of, did you find a lot of television no, stuff? Not a lot. Yeah. I mean, you saw most of what we found. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, it's interesting when you first come across something like Afternoon of a Fawn and, and, and you're so seduced by that. And truly, I was seduced by, by Tanny. Um, and then you realize that you're going to have to blow that footage up to a big screen because that was shot for television as well. Um, you kind of shudder at what it's going to look like. But frankly, I think people are very um, accepting of footage off of television, and they understand they're looking at vintage, vintage footage. So I don't know. I mean, maybe the audience can answer that better than I can, but I well, think it comes across pretty well. Older television footage has its own beauty now. That's so, right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Um, it's, 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 a, it's a different time, and so it, you know, with, without... It lacks the smoothness of images now, but then that gives it that's its... That's right. Yeah. Well, that's another thing I think that I took from the other film because the other film was very strongly um, a function of archival footage and uh, shot in the 60s. And it, that kind of footage has an aesthetic that I think is a gift to us. Um, you know, we've, uh, there was an article in the New York Times recently about the strong use of archival footage in documentaries more and more where the archival footage really tells a story. And um, I think that it really can carry a film in ways that maybe we didn't think it could years ago. Was there anything that surprised you as you were doing your research? No. Um, I think the complexity of the relationships between Tani and Balanchine and Tani and, and Jerry. Um, and, you know, th the need to accept Tani's um, fate. Uh, we grow up, I, I don't know, I, I remember reading so many stories about people who were paralyzed and films that were made in the 50s and 60s where these people become heroic in our minds. They develop a mythology around them that um, I'm not sure always stands up in real life. You know, from, from um, Clara and Heidi to An Affair to Remember where the, the subject of that film is, um, becomes the romantic object. And, and, and in fact, her love is, is intensified once her lover finds out that she's paralyzed. Um, Tani had to accept what happened to her. And she, in fact, the two men in her life who were such inspirations to her and her to them, um, actually drift away from her. And she ends up living most of her life alone, surrounded by friends and, and having a very rich life. But those very powerful relationships um, are no longer really a major part of her life anymore. And, learn, and, and understanding her heroics are really more about her acceptance um, and her reconciliation with what happened as compared to overcoming or triumphing over her polio. I think that was the surprise for me personally. Mm -hmm. I also think that the film is a very rich portrait of a time, uh, and I, I really wanted to comment on that and just talk about that a little bit because it really, you're beginning with the moment when Tanny is coming of age, and um, the film is extremely evocative uh, yeah. of its time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I think, I think it is, and I would have loved to have shown more of that, as a mm -hmm. matter of fact. I, I know there's, there's wonderful footage of um, other members of the New York City Ballet um, that we would have loved to have dealt with more, and, and Tani had some very important relationships in the ballet that we didn't have time to deal with. Um, and I think that, you know, over the next few months as we show this film, maybe we can get some of those people to comment on it and become part of question and answer sessions. Mm -hmm. But, um, I, of course, we've lost some of those people as well. Mm -hmm. Many of Tani's friends are no longer with us. But um, it, was, it was a joy to work with people like Barbara and Randy and, and Arthur and, and Pat. Um, everybody who participated in this film really enriched it. And one of the things that I, I found very exciting is that their stories were really stories told by friends. Um, they're not, they don't come on the screen as experts, as, as we often see in, in documentaries that are often very important to the documentaries. But in this case, these are people who are intimately involved in Teddy's life. And I think it adds a, an intimacy to the story.
Did it, I hope everyone got that, but I'll just repeat it uh, in case. Um, the question is, how much did Balanchine uh, know of her, her relationship with Jerry Robbins? How did it affect uh, their relationship and the relationship between the two men, the two of them? Are you, are you asking if he was jealous? <laughs> yeah. I, I, I really can't answer that, Karen. Um, I think that George Balanchine was, I, I suspect, was quite secure in his relationship in the dance world and with Tanny. Um, and there are people in this audience who I think could talk to that much better than I can. Um, and maybe we'll get them to talk about it at some point. But, uh, I, you know, George and Jerry worked very closely together for many, many years. And Jerry idolized George Balanchine in much the same way that the rest of the dance world did. So I, I can't imagine that he was terribly threatened by that. And, and Tani was very much in love with George. So you know, even though she maintained a long relationship with Jerry, and I'm sure there were periods of time in her life where she really turned to Jerry for solace, um, I think at the end, um, her, her, the strength of her relationship with George probably predominated. <laughs> Speak for yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Beg your pardon. <laughs> Well, first of all, oh, do you want to repeat the question? Well, the question is, has Nancy actually shown the film to younger audiences, particularly people, who, teenagers? Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, you are the first people to see this film. So um, if there are any people in the audience who are 14, 15, and 16, then Raise your <laughs> hands, yeah. <laughs> um, I, actually, what you're saying is, is, is important to us because we do like to think that this story is a universal story, and it goes beyond the particulars of Tani's life. Um, and, and we hope that, you know, her stoicism, her acceptance, her ability to move on, um, we're all going to deal with, well, hopefully not tragic, but certain twists of fate and, and limitations that will affect us as we age. And um, I think that there are lessons in this film that deal with um, not just what Tani dealt with, but what we'll all be dealing with eventually. So I think it's a film that I hope um, develops some compassion It was, it was difficult for you to tell how many years she, she, danced, as she, she danced as a principal dancer yeah. with the company. Yeah. She started dancing, and again, if, if I get this wrong, I hope someone can correct me. I think she began dancing as a principal. She, she actually never danced in the company, by the way, in the court of ballet. She went right from the School of American Ballet to solo roles, which was very unusual. And, and that began sometime in the late 40s uh, or, or mid 40s. And she was stricken with polio when she, in 1956. So that gives you an idea of how much time she had. Um, Joanna, do I see? Yeah. She, did, she, the question is, did Nancy plan to have Patricia McBride on camera? Yeah, I would have loved to. Patricia McBride lives in London. And we never could work it out, so she could be on camera. And, and frankly, she was just as happy not being on camera. I think she was a little bit shy. So she, she was very happy to have her voice in the film. One more. Let's see. Um, I, I guess that the, the question that I'd like to, oh, do you, is there someone? Oh, no, OK. The question, oh, yes.
Well, I did, and that was Barbara Horgan, who I just, I'm totally indebted to her for helping me make this film. Um, but very quickly, I met other people in the community, Heather Watts, um, as I mentioned, Ricky Weiss down in North Carolina, um, many at the School of American Ballet, um, and I'm probably, uh, well, Jacques, Jacques D'Amboise. Where is Jacques, by the way? Is he still here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Arthur Mitchell, where's Arthur? There's Jacques. Woo. And is Arthur Mitchell still here in the audience? Oh. Uh. Uh, just a little aside about <laughs> Candy in the Iron Lung. Uh, we were dancing in Cologne, La Premier Afternoon before in Western Symphony, and the company was going on to Copenhagen and then stopped. I, we both were sick with uh, bronchitis, and I hugged her goodbye because I was going, uh, my wife, Carolyn, was about to deliver our child. So I didn't go to Copenhagen. I flew to New York for the birth of my son, George, uh, who Balanchine thought was named after him. <laughs> <laughs> my mother's name was Georgette. <laughs> and I married Carolyn George. <laughs> <laughs> but what's really interesting uh, is when they came back, Balanchine came and gave me a Danish sweater with silver buttons. And he said when he went to Tammy, when she was coming out of the Iron Lock and he would visit her, she said, stop smoking, it's hurting me. And he is, everybody smoked. He stopped like that. And he very proudly said, I stopped. The next question, she said to Jacques, that his wife had a, a baby, that Jacques had his baby. And Valentin said, yes, boy, named after me, George. <laughs> <laughs> and Tanny said, because I love sweaters, I love it. Get him a Danish sweater with silver bullets <laughs> in, instead of. And he said, I can't get silver bullets. I'll get silver buttons. Right? So that, my wife is born now, but that sweater is in a closet with no other clothes except my wife's dress that she wore. The two of them were together. Uh, anyway, uh, Valentine used to give everybody cartons of cigarettes as gifts. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and thank you, Nancy, and thank you all for coming. Thank, thank you, you very much. <laughs>